there may not be a singular book of Joseph, but the largest narrative of Genesis covers Joseph in the book. This tells us that such an account carries great significance and as such is worth a special observance. Within Genesis chapters 37 to 50, we will discover the patterns of God's work through his providence and his promises for his people, all of which are interwoven through human fallenness, failures, and betrayal, which means this, what man meant for evil, God meant for good. This is the picture and power of the gospel. Throughout the account, Joseph may be the central figure, but his family, especially Judah, draws a prophetic line to the coming Messiah. You see, through Joseph in the book, God is reversing the curse and revealing the blessing. And that is why in Joseph's life, we see a type of Christ, betrayed by his own family, only to one day be in the very position to save many. So as we trace the life of Joseph from a low pit to the high palace, let us learn the lessons and know the blessings of steady obedience to God's promises regardless of our circumstances. This is Joseph in the book, evil recycled for good. All right, so if you have not been with us or you may have missed some of the messages before today, you can access them on our app, on our website, or on YouTube. If you have the margin, I would encourage you to go backwards. As we take you forward, you'll get a aerial view of what the narrative of Joseph is all about. But more importantly, we have already walked our way through Genesis chapter 37, the interruption that is Genesis chapter 38, dealing with Judah, Genesis chapter 39, where Joseph ends up as a slave in Potiphar's house. By the end of chapter 39, he's an inmate of the state of Egypt, being falsely accused of sexual assault by Potiphar's wife, you know this. And then of course, at the very beginning of chapter 40, there are two new inmates inserted into Joseph's context. That would include the butler and the baker, two officers of Pharaoh. They end up in the very location, which is exactly where God needed Joseph to be. God leads you where he needs you. That's one of the major lessons thus far. God leads you where he needs you. Remember, you don't have to choose your circumstances in order for God to use your circumstances. Do you believe that, church? Like, you do not have to, and a lot of the times in life, you don't choose the very circumstances that you are in, the trials, the troubles, the pains, you don't choose them, but obviously if God is sovereign, he's allowed them to touch your life for a reason, a divine purpose, if you will. He's always moving us from our comfort zone, I would say, he never leaves us in the same condition he found us. He absolutely loves us where we are, that's the God of the Bible, loves you where you are, unwilling to leave you the way you are. Joseph is 17 in Genesis chapter 37. In his 20s, maybe mid-20s, maybe late 20s by Genesis chapter 40, all we know is at the end of chapter 40, after he interprets two dreams, he makes a request to the butler in light of the confidence that he interpreted the dream accurately, remember me. Remember me when you get out of here. Remember me when it's good with you. Then he tells him why. I've been placed here unjustly. Remember me. Now we stop and we know that's where we left off before we jump back into Genesis 41 verse one. It's gonna give us another timestamp which I, I find absolutely necessary to talk about. Before we do that, Here's where we begin, from the aerial, back to heaven. What is God up to? Well, God has a plan. And that perfect plan is often carried out through man. That's you and I. God's perfect plan ordered perfectly for man. Ordered, another word, ordained. You can say appointed. For your life, God has a perfect plan that is ordered, but not just ordered perfectly, perfectly in order. In other words, 
Sometimes life is messy. I don't have to give too much color commentary on the chaos that is our world. All you have to do is do one scroll through any social media and you will realize this world is on its way to hell. That's actually biblical. It's spinning off its axis. It's chaotic, it's confusing. And wait a second, you're telling me God has a plan that's perfectly ordered and in the midst of that, it's perfectly in order? Oh yes. Everything is exactly as God would have it. He's working through individuals. He's working through nations. He's working even when you can't see it. Psalm 33, 11, his counsel will stand forever from generation to generation. His counsel will stand. Proverbs 19, 21, many are the plans of a man's heart. I have many plans in my heart, but hey, it's the Lord's purpose that will prevail. The goal is to make sure the plans of my heart are brought into alignment with the will of God. And the only way you can know the will of God is if you spend time in the revealed will of God, the word. So yeah, many are the plans of a man's heart. Basically saying many are the plans of a man's heart, the plans that man makes apart from God, cannot evade, cannot escape the perfect plan of God. In other words, God is gonna lead you where he needs you. He's going to accomplish his will in your life with or without your participation. I just find it easier to participate with the process, right, than fighting it, running from it. So we do, we take a look in the book. Genesis 41 Verse one, then it came to pass at the end of two full years. All right, stop, because there's another time stamp. Remember, Joseph is 17, according to Genesis 37. 17 years of age. We're told at the end of this chapter, okay, we're not gonna get there today, but we're told that he's 30 when he is brought before the Pharaoh. So 17 to 30, there's 13 years. We're not told how old he is when he is accused of sexual assault and placed into a prison. You can maybe conjecture and say he was definitely several years into his experience as a slave with Potiphar. You can reduce that and go, all right, he served several years, there's no way he comes in as a slave, serves in the fields, Potiphar recognizes there's something different about this slave, would entrust that type of slave with more responsibility, taking him from the fields, right, outside of the privacy of the house, to placing him in the privacy of the house, because he was trustworthy, and the Bible tells us why he was a successful man. The Lord was with him, right? In those instances where it seems like Joseph, betrayed by his own family, left seemingly for dead in a pit, sold as a slave in a foreign land, Egypt. Where's God at in that? (laughs) The Holy Spirit inspires Moses, I love it, to answer that question. And the Lord was with Joseph. There he is, there's the Lord. And all through the text, we discover Joseph is marked by the Spirit of God. Potiphar recognized it, Eventually, the warden of the prison recognized it. Two full years passed since what? Well, you don't have to go back. I'll tell you what happened. He told the butler, remember me. He told the baker the interpretation of his dream, you're gonna be hung. He told the butler, you will be restored. Remember me. Now, if we add the skin of humanity to the text, and this is something we often don't do. We just kind of read through it, one chapter, let's get to the next chapter, and we don't actually think through what just occurred. And I don't know about you, but if I'm Joseph, and I just got done helping this other inmate out, and he gets called out of the jail cell, the Pharaoh is summoning the butler and the baker, and you know that what you just got done telling them is about to happen. And you even hear, perhaps through the rumor mill, that 
that guy you just did time with, he got hung, just like you said. And the butler, he has been restored. I don't know, I'm waiting two hours. Two hours, I'm like, all right, I can't wait to hear the, 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 the chinging of the keys on the guard to come open the gate, and there's gonna be the butler going, dude, thank you so much. No, but two hours, maybe he got preoccupied. I'm sure there was a coming home party planned by his family. So I would wait two days. Two days would be like, all right, here we go. He's gonna certainly come back and remember me. Two months? After two months, do you begin to say, maybe he forgot? The text goes out of the way to say, at the end of two full years. Remember, the point is clear. You may be forgotten by man, but you are never forsaken by God. You gotta get that, church. You may have been forgotten by man, by family, by friends, but you have never been forsaken by God. Joseph's life, the very steps he has taken thus far, the very stops, whether abruptly or not, the setbacks, didn't see that one coming. And even I would say his stumbles and his falls, all of which have been ordained or to take a psalm ordered by the Lord. Psalm 37, 23, and 24. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. Did you catch that? And, and the steps of the Lord are ordered by the Lord, or the steps of a man are ordered by the Lord. The steps of a man are ordered by the Lord, and so are his stops. And so are his setbacks. And so are his stumbles. All of which ordered by the Lord. Think about that. 13 years of steps and stops and setbacks and a stumble. And yet the Lord is upholding him. Right, this is kind of where we're at. Joseph's in a jail cell. Two full years have passed. And it tells us, Pharaoh had a dream. And behold, he stood by the river, verses two to four. Suddenly there came up out of the river seven cows. It's very abrupt, it's very sudden. We're introduced to another dream. The entire account of Joseph is built on dreams. Two given to Joseph, two given while he was an inmate with the bake, buck, butler and baker, two, as we will read, given to Pharaoh. There came up out of the river seven cows, fine looking and fat, and they fed in the meadow. Then behold, seven other cows came up after them out of the river, ugly and gaunt, and stood by the other cows on the bank of the river. And the ugly and gaunt cows ate up the seven fine looking and fat cows, so Pharaoh awoke. All right, whether you read that or you let me read it over you, that's a gnarly dream. Right, what does he see? He sees a healthy, plump, fat group of cows, seven. They're kind of grazing, not uncommon to do so, in the bed of the Nile. Out of that same river comes some ugly, gaunt, unhealthy cows. And those ugly and gaunt cows eat up the seven healthy ones. All right, I do not know what Pharaoh was smoking the night before. <laughs> but we discover this is a God-given dream. Hey, let's do this real quick. As I reread the dream, would you place your eyes on the screen? Here's the imagery. And behold, Pharaoh stood by the river. Suddenly, there came up out of the river seven cows fine looking and fat, and they fed in the meadow. Then behold, seven other cows came up after them out of the river, ugly and gaunt, and they stood by the other cows on the bank of the river, and the ugly and gaunt cows ate up the seven fine looking and fat cows. Right, I found that little clip actually watching with wide-eyed wonder 
with my daughter Willow in a children's animation called Superbook, and it just so happened to be Joseph. And I'm all like, oh. I'm looking at her like, yeah, did you put this, how did, are you listening? Anyway, I'm amazed at the imagery. I'm going, that's pretty accurate. And I wanted you guys to see the imagery just as we're about to do with the corn because it's one thing to read it. It's an entirely different thing to actually visualize it because this is what's troubling as we'll discover the Pharaoh. Verse five, again, he slept and dreamed a second time. He goes back to sleep and suddenly seven heads of grain came up on one stalk, plump and good. Then behold, seven thin heads blighted by the east wind sprang up after them and the seven thin heads devoured the seven plump and full heads. So Pharaoh awoke and indeed it was a dream. Again, let me reread the dream with your eyes on the screen. And behold, seven heads of grain came up on one stalk plump and good. Seven thin heads blighted by the wind sprang up after them. Seven thin heads devoured the seven plump and full heads. Just like that, so Pharaoh awoke. Obviously, he's troubled. Now before we talk about how troubled he is, we must reference how God speaks. In the book of Joseph, in the Bible, in other various parts, in the Old Testament, and yes, even in the New, God chose to speak through dreams. Interestingly, the recipient of dreams, not all of them, but many of them, were pagan kings, which is interesting. God would give a pagan king his revelatory vision or dream, and then he would bring alongside of that king one filled with his spirit in order to interpret this is significant because a lot of people today wanna to know, does God still speak? Does he still speak through dreams? Does he still speak through the supernatural? Well, let's get something out of the way. In Hebrews chapter one, in the first few verses, that writer, he sets out to tell the church at the time the living and breathing word of God, and he says that God in times past has spoke through various means and methods to the prophets, all right? We know that, that's what the Old Testament is built upon, God speaking to choice individuals. It then says, but in these last days, he has spoken through his son. The final revelation from God is the son of God. There is no new revelation. Ladies and gentlemen, look at me. If it's new, it's not true. And if it's true, it's not new. What we must do is know the word so well that when somebody might have a vision or a revelation that we're able to take it and bring it back into alignment with the word of God. What I'm trying to say is God may be still speaking through the supernatural. There are testimonials coming out from a lot of Muslim countries that Jesus is visiting people in their dreams. And what they're seeing in their dreams is leading them to having a relationship with the one true God through Jesus Christ, his son. I don't know, that's biblical. If you can't reach them through the Quran, or can't reach them through their mosque, the Lord chooses whom he will visit. But for us, yeah, I believe he still speaks through the supernatural. But I wanna be very clear when I say all revelation must be scriptural. Though he still speaks through the supernatural, that revelation, yes, even your crazy dreams must be scriptural. Unless you're having dreams about fat cat, cows and skinny cows eating the fat cows and unless your corn in your mind is, unless it's in alignment with the Bible, I don't know, man, you just, had a, you just had a crazy dream. I had a crazy dream the other night. Can I share it with you? There was like this balloon in the sky. <laughs> and it was sponsored by the CCP. And it was traveling across the continental America. And I woke up and I was like, are we gonna shoot that thing down? Are you, are you guys familiar with this dream? That wasn't a dream? Oh my goodness. 
Verse 8. Now it came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled. Of course it was. And he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all its wise men, and Pharaoh told them his dreams. But there was no one who could interpret them for Pharaoh. Now, now stop. This is the most powerful man in the land, in the known world, Pharaoh, who thought himself a god. He's so troubled in spirit after these dreams that he summons his wise men, right, the intellectuals of his empire, and his magi, or magicians, they are the pagan priests, they're the spiritual of his empire, and he brings them together, and he's asking them if they could interpret this wild dreams that he has had, and they couldn't. And there's a lesson here for us. There's a lesson that no matter who you are, no matter how much power you have, no matter how much prominence, Man's wisdom is foolishness to God. But not only that, the God of the universe found it fitting to shake this man to his core. What is revealed after this troubling in his spirit is that he is totally desperate and he has wrongly placed his dependence upon people. The magi, the magicians, some would say the astrologers, the wise men. You know, this would happen hundreds of years later in the life of Daniel, same song, same dance, the Babylonian Empire, Nebuchadnezzar is the king, he has troubling dreams as well, he wakes up, it, it almost parallels what we just read, he's troubled in his spirit, he calls for his wise men, he asks them to tell him the dream and the interpretation. They shoot back, tell us the dream. He says to them, I'm not gonna tell you the dream, you're just biding time. You tell me the dream, you tell me the interpretation. They say to him, this request has never been made by any king, in any time, in any place. He says, if you don't tell me my dream and the interpretation, I will kill all wise men. And this is where God is raising up Daniel, which I love. Like, when things are happening over here, God has his man in the wings. And he's raising up this Hebrew, this Jew named Daniel, who is also gonna be filled with the Spirit of God, who is gonna be raised to a position of prominence and at the right time, give an interpretation to a pagan king that would be the actual roadmap of human history. Significant as it is, God is showing man that we are totally desperate without him. Right? Man is but the dust of the earth. Though he wears a crown on his head, though he sits upon a golden throne, man is but the dust of the earth. From dust to dust in Genesis chapter 3. Unless there's something that interrupts that trajectory that I am coming from dust and I am going to dust. I am made of the dust of the earth unless I am a recipient of the breath of life. I wonder if any of us in this room are recognizing the gravity of what I just said. That for guys like the Pharaoh and Nebuchadnezzar and anyone in our life that doesn't know the Lord, that anyone that does not have the actual breath of life, the spirit of God, should be absolutely terrified at the breath of life at the brevity of life, that no one is guaranteed, not even the next second, and that all of our lives are held in the hand of God, that the God of the universe would find it fitting to shake our lives in order to get our undivided attention and to get us to receive the spirit of God, the breath of life, which is what anchors us I don't think that I would, I would be doing what God has called me to do if I just move on without asking. If there's somebody in this place that does not have the breath of life in their lungs, you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, I'm telling you, as truthfully as I can, you are going from dust to dust. And yet, when you go to that second dust, 
your spirit is passing to another place. And unless you have the Holy Spirit, unless you are what the Bible says, born again. No, listen to me, not born into a Christian family. Born again into God's family. Not you have a long history of church attendance. Not that you come to church, but that you would come to Christ and that you would surrender all and that you would be filled with the breath of life and your life would then be marked by the Spirit of God so that you can come alongside a Nebuchadnezzar or a Pharaoh who has a question about life's troubles and you can give them the answer of peace. This is exactly this is why we study scripture, right? It's not to know more. Pharaoh is troubled in spirit. His wise men, his counselors cannot tell him the interpretation of his dream. It, the stage is being set. Like the, the, the moment that we've all been waiting for is, is coming. As we continue, guess who enters the equation? The butler. Verses nine to 13. Then the chief butler spoke to Pharaoh. Of course, he hears all of these exchanges between the magi, the wise men, and he's there listening, and it says, I remember my faults this day when Pharaoh was angry with his servants. Now, mind you, this is two years earlier. He remembers something that occurred and put me in custody in the house of the captain of the guard, both me and the chief baker. We each had a dream in one night, he and I. Each of us dreamed according to the interpretation of his own dream. Now, stop, because there's, it makes no difference how this comes out. Many have reduced that first statement, I remember my faults this day, as if he is actually convicted over forgetting Joseph. I don't see it that way. It's okay if that's what you want to think, that he's remembering that, oh, I forgot Joseph. Uh-uh. This guy is selfish. Clearly. He sees an opportunity to place himself back in the favor of the Pharaoh. He remembers his faults against the Pharaoh that day. I, oh, man, I remember when I, when I transgressed you and I ended up in prison, me and the baker. There was a guy there who interpreted our dreams. That's what he says in verse 12. There was a young Hebrew man with us there, a servant of the captain of the guard, and we told him, and he interpreted our dreams for us. To each man he interpreted according to his own dream, and it came to pass just as he interpreted for us, so it happened. He restored me to my office, speaking of the Pharaoh, and he hanged him. Isn't it something, at the end of chapter 40, it tells us that the butler forgot about Joseph. It goes out of the way to say he forgot and went on with his life. And yet at the perfect time, exactly when God needed to use Joseph is when his amnesia lifts. Oh yeah. I mean, was that actually in him to have that thought? Maybe the conversation about the Pharaoh's troubling dreams spurred him on, but I'm saying all this, <laughs> this is God's providence. Forgotten as he was, not forsaken, because at the right time, Joseph is going to be remembered. Now, let's play this out before we move on. He gets out, his dream is fulfilled, he's amazed, he goes back to the prison, says to Joseph, just as you said, I'm gonna do what I can to get you out of here. Goes to Potiphar, hey Potiphar, that guy Joseph, you know about him, he served in your household, come on man, there's gotta be something we can do to get him out. Potiphar's like, you know what, you're right. Joseph, you are free to go. Where does Joseph go? I don't know. Does he stay in Egypt? Does he journey back to Canaan? Where does he go? I don't know, but he goes somewhere because he's not gonna take camp next to the prison. So now two years later, the Pharaoh has his troubling dreams and nobody can interpret the dreams. Imagine then, the butler goes, I got a guy, I, I know a guy. And then they set out, and Joseph is nowhere to be found. But by God's grace, who kept him in that place. For Esther's line, such a time as this. 
Guys, I get it. For all of us, we've made request of our God. Lord, would you do this thing? Lord, would you get me out of this trial? Lord, would you bring deliverance over here? Lord, would you bring that wayward child back? Lord, would you heal this diagnosis? Lord, would you give me that job opportunity? I mean, fill in the blank, all of these requests, these petitions we've made to God, and when they don't unfold, or they're not fulfilled, or they're not answered in our timing, in the way we've thought about it, or desired it, isn't it easy to assume God has forgotten you? Because if he loved me, he wouldn't leave me in this circumstance. What do we do in those seasons of doubt? We often neglect our faith and we no longer trust God as good because we think that he has forsaken us. Spiritual principle for all of us, whether a prayer request is delayed, you're asking God for it and it seems like it's being put off, whether a request is flat out denied, <laughs> your responsibility is to remain devoted. In the midst of the denial, in the midst of the delay, you, Christian, you remain devoted. In other words, I'm gonna trust God regardless. I am gonna put my faith in Jesus knowing that he loves me more than I can love me. He has a better plan for my life that I could manufacture. So whether this petition to God is delayed and God says, no, no, not yet, there's still some finishing pieces in your heart and your character. Or whether it's a flat out, no, that's not good for you. Would you trust him and remain devoted to him as a good steward of time? We're not told what Joseph did for those two years. But there must have been some finishing touches on his character that the Lord wanted to do. Remember when he said to that butler, remember me, like get me out of here. When it's all good with you, get me out of here. I don't know, that's maybe a revelation of what was going on in his heart. And we don't know because it doesn't tell us much more. And it's, it's dangerous, actually, to actually assume an emotion or an attitude upon any individual in the Bible unless it clearly tells us. So I always try to stay on that tightrope and go, I don't, I don't know what he's thinking, but I'm, I'm a human like he was. And if that isn't fulfilled and that request is denied, I'm gonna feel it. But how long do I feel it is the question, is the challenge. Do I sit in it? And if I sit in it, what happens? That's when I get bitter. That's when I get resentful. That's when I get angry. That's when I get fearful. That's when I get doubtful. Or those happen in moments and I go, all right, Lord, forgive me for not trusting you. I'm back. I don't know what Joseph was feeling. What I do know is this. God uses man to accomplish his plan. Just as he was going to use the butler in his timing to tell the Pharaoh, I got a guy. I got a guy named Joey. But here's what we have to do if we're being honest with our faith. There's nothing wrong with trusting God to use man. There's everything wrong with trusting man as your God. Right, trusting a man, a person, to do what only God can do. We're all guilty as charged, right? We lean into, and there's beauty in relationship and fellowship. Now as we speed up a little bit, watch what happens. This is amazing. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they brought him quickly, underline that, out of the dungeon, and he shaved, changed his clothing, and came to Pharaoh. In an instant, he is an inmate of the state. He is then summoned to the head of the state. He is wearing prison garb. He's probably scruffy, not able to shave each day. Now, it has nothing to do with him wanting to present himself before the Pharaoh and everything to do with their culture. You were not allowed to present yourself to Pharaoh unclean. And hair in the Egyptian culture was often unclean. So they shave Joseph, they change his clothing, and they present him to the Pharaoh. And the Pharaoh says to Joseph, I have had a dream, and there is no one who can interpret it, but I've heard it said of you that you can understand a dream to interpret it. Stop. This is the moment we've all been waiting for. This is the moment that Joseph had no idea he was waiting for. Did you get that? 
This is the moment we've been waiting for because we know how this story unfolds. But this is the moment Joseph had no idea he was waiting for. What was he doing? For 13 years, he was doing what was righteous regardless of the consequence. He was doing what was righteous regardless of the consequence. That's it. He was serving where God had placed him. He was stewarding with what God had entrusted to him. And he was suffering successfully through it. In a moment's time, he is summoned to the Pharaoh. You know what the Pharaoh does not say? Can I see your resume? I would like to go over your work history. All right, Pharaoh, but if I may add some qualifications along the way, I see here that you were a shepherd in your father's house, and then what happened? Well, well, Pharaoh, it wasn't my fault. Um, my dad gave me a jacket. That's kind of like the one you just gave me to come in, in your presence, but my brothers didn't like me, and they decided to try to kill me, and then they threw me into a pit, left me for dead, and then they wanted to make some money off me, so they decided to sell me to a guy named Potiphar. Do you know Potiphar? Oh, the Pharaoh would say, is that the next several years of your work history here? Well, tell me what happened in Potiphar's house. While I was serving well, he elevated him to a position of promotion in his house. I was entrusted with everything except the food that he ate. And then Mrs. Potiphar, she took a liking to me. And uh, Pharaoh, what is being accused of me is not true. And that's how I ended up in prison. And like, that's not what happens here. You wanna know why? Because God does not need our resume to have his way. And that is not to discredit our abilities and our accomplishments, but that is simply to say, God does not need our work history to get the glory. He's just looking for ready, obedient hearts and minds that are waiting on the Lord, not waiting on the world, and I'm serving him where I'm at. And what he does in a split second of time is he brings Joseph exactly where he had need of him preparing him all through those years for this one moment. So Joseph answers the Pharaoh saying, it is not in me. God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. Now this is pretty cool because this is where you can put scripture together and begin to see a spiritual progression or a maturation, a maturity of sorts in Joseph from 17 years of age when he first has two dreams, Genesis 37 verses five to nine. He says to his siblings and his dad, hear this dream I have dreamed. No mention of God. Some have pinned him as a spoiled brat, maybe haughty, prideful, maybe. The text doesn't tell us that. We can, we can assume there's something amiss in Joseph's character. He is telling this dream, maybe not in its right time, and the brothers are envious and they hate him all the more for it. Okay, Genesis 37, five to nine, hear this dream I have dreamed. He says that twice. The next time there's dreams and Joseph has to engage them, it's Genesis 40, verse eight. They tell them these wild dreams. You know what he says? Do not interpretations belong to God. Tell them to me. Now, now we're seeing, he mentions God, interpretations of dreams come by God, tell them to me. So, so maybe there's this sense of like, hey, God's gonna interpret it, but tell them to me. I don't know, that's what I'm reading. Because now, guess what he says in 41, 16. Joseph answered Pharaoh and said, what's it say? It's not in me. It's not in me. It's not in me. God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. And I love that, because you're actually seeing Joseph is finally getting out of his own way, in a sense. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, behold, in my dream, I stood on the bank of the river. Suddenly seven cows came up out of the river, fine looking and fat. They fed in the meadow. And behold, seven other cows came up after them, poor and very ugly and gaunt. Such ugliness I have never seen in all the land of Egypt. And the gaunt and ugly cows ate up the first seven, the fat cows. When they had eaten them up, no one would have known that they had eaten them, for they were just as ugly as at the beginning. So I awoke. Also, I saw in my dream, and suddenly seven heads came up on one stalk, full and good. Then behold, seven heads, withered, thin, and blighted by the east wind, sprang up after them, and the thin heads devoured the seven good heads. So I told this to my magicians, 
but there was no one who could explain it to me. So Joseph said to the Pharaoh, here's the interpretation, the dreams are one, one meaning. God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. Let me say that again. God does not show Pharaoh what's about to happen. God shows Pharaoh what he is about to do, what God is about to accomplish, his purpose. The seven good cows are seven years. The seven good heads are seven years. The dreams are one. The seven thin and ugly cows which came up after them are seven years. The seven empty heads blighted by the east wind are seven years of famine. We have a 14 year timeline. This is the thing which I have spoken to Pharaoh. God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. Indeed, seven years of great plenty will come throughout the land of Egypt, but after them, seven years of famine will arise, and all the plenty will be forgotten in the land of Egypt, and the famine will deplete the land. So the plenty will not be known in the land because of the famine following, for it will be very severe. That word means very heavy, many, very oppressive. The seven years of prosperity would actually not be remembered because the following seven years of famine would be so devastating, people would not be able to remember what it was once like in the land. And the dream was repeated to Pharaoh twice because the thing is established by God and God will shortly bring it to pass. This is about to happen. It's actually a very simplistic interpretation. Seven and seven. Seven years of complete prosperity, agriculturally, economically, and then seven years of complete and utter devastation and famine. Now, now Joseph might not be asked, but he's about to give a solution. Watch this, verses 33 to 36. Now therefore, let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh do this and let him appoint officers over the land to collect one-fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt in the seven plentiful years, that's 20%, that's a tax. And let them gather all the food of those good years that are coming and store up the grain under the authority of Pharaoh and let them keep food in the cities. Then that food shall be as a reserve for the land in the seven years of famine which shall be in the land of Egypt that the land may not perish during the famine. As quickly as he interprets this dream, we'll say it's a powerful prediction, is as quickly as God's wisdom provides for him what is called a practical preparation, right? He's got the knowledge to know the dream, and now he's about to share the wisdom to get through the revelation. I think that's pretty cool because a lot of us have been given the gift of knowledge, not knowledge in the sense of a word of knowledge, knowledge in the sense that we have an ability to learn, right? Knowledge would be wisdom, no, knowledge is insight, information, and intellect, right? But the knowledge needs to give way to wisdom. Wisdom is the application of knowledge. So it don't, it don't matter what you know. It don't matter how many Bible verses you can memorize. It doesn't matter how much insight you may have. It's making a connection that goes from the head to the heart and applies it. You wanna know why I say that? Because there's gonna be people all across the land tonight who are called armed chair quarterbacks. Oh, and some of these guys have never even thrown a football in their entire life. And yet in an instant, they got all the knowledge in the world of what Jalen Hurts should have done in the midst of that play. And I'm going, really? And there's a lot of armchair pastors too. And there's a lot of armchair people. A lot of knowledge. So easy to critique what this church has gone through over the past two years from the cheap seats. It's an entirely different thing to have the wisdom that God himself provides for his people to make a decision to do the next righteous thing regardless of the consequence. And like Joseph for 13 years, serving in what we call obscurity in private, the only reason we see it is because we have access to the word of God. Other than that, we wouldn't know about this slave, we wouldn't know about this inmate, we would know about the prime minister. But I'm saying to you, what we do in private all this time will be made publicly apparent 
like how we're serving in private over the course of our life when nobody's watching, when we're faithful and obedient where God has placed us and we're not looking for a way out. We are content with where God has us, with what we have or don't have. Like Paul said, I've learned the secret of contentment. Can I tell you that secret? I have learned that it is Christ's strength within me that helps me endure through everything around me. Watch what Pharaoh says. So the advice was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all his servants. And Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find such a man as this? A man in whom is the spirit of God. This is a pagan king making mention of the spirit, the Ruach Elohim. That's Hebrew. We can't find a single person in all the empire who has the spirit of God. Joseph was in the Pharaoh's presence for no more than 10 minutes, maybe five. Here's my dream. Here's the interpretation of the dream. Here's the plan. Pharaoh's response, I'm saying in five to 10 minutes, God is going to elevate Joseph to what we call the prime minister of Egypt. He goes from the inmate of the state to the actual prime minister of the state. And the most notable marker in Joseph's life to date, Genesis 37 to Genesis chapter 41, is the spirit of God. And that is true for you. The most notable marker in your life is not the experience of man. The most notable marker in your life is the presence of God. Again, that doesn't disqualify experience. I'm simply stating the most notable and noble marker is having Jesus Christ in your life. And how God is able to take anyone, regardless of a resume, regardless of experiences, and use that person as a launch pad for his glory. Joseph obviously teaches us that the steps and the stops and the setbacks and the stumbles are ordered and ordained by the Lord. We learn that no matter who you are, no matter what position of power, without the spirit of God, the breath of life, man will go from dust to dust and then end up in a place even worse. Your petitions, your requests may be delayed, they may be denied. Your responsibility is to remain devoted. It is better to be with Jesus, spend time with him, learning his will, his way, walking out his walk, than to have anything this world can offer. That's the call of the church. As we pick up next Sunday, Lord willingly, we're gonna complete Genesis 41. We're gonna see a, a, what I'm calling a complete reversal, a, a complete reversal of what Joseph has lost. And the Lord is going to show us how he is the God who redeems and restores. So I'd love for you to read ahead so that you're well prepared for next time. We're gonna close out with a song. I'm gonna pray us out. And then we're gonna sing about God's breath in our lungs. So let's pray. Father, I thank you for this opportunity to teach and preach your word. I thank you that you make much of yourself through anyone Oh God, I pray your people here would hear what the Spirit is saying to the church and that we would be filled by your Holy Spirit and that the world around us would take notice like Pharaoh. Perhaps, oh God, that would be what you use to lead people to yourself. So thank you for your word declared. And we thank you for your Holy Spirit renewed. In the name of Jesus, amen.